This is We The Sales Engineers Podcast, show 279. Welcome to We The SE's Podcast, the show for sales engineers by sales engineers with your host, What's going Ramsey on, SE Nation? Welcome back to another episode. Generally speaking, the common rule that I stick to is if you've never been an SE before, don't be the first SE in the company. But my guest today is the exception to the rule. We're going to talk about why later, but... My guest today, his name is Chris Schneider, and he's a brand new SE, newish SE. Well, he's been an SE for almost a year now, but he is the first SE at his company. And there are reasons that he took that on, took on that role, and there are reasons why he's successful. And we're going to talk throughout the show about those reasons. So let's jump in and listen to what Chris has to say. Good morning, Mr. Schneider. How you doing? Good morning, Ramsey. Big fan, and I'm actually pretty honored to be on your show. <laughs> so well, the the honor is mine. I appreciate it. Uh, we, we've been talking, we've been going back and forth. So I'm happy to finally talk to you in person for the first time. Right. And most of my podcasts are kind of like that, so it's always fun. Um, and I enjoy putting people on the spot on the podcast. Perfect. It makes my life. I, it makes me enjoy it. I don't know. Maybe I'm <laughs> just take a little bit. It's like some sick satisfaction. <laughs> like I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. throw some curveballs at this guy. Yeah, so why are you even here, man? No. <laughs> <laughs> I've been bothering you on LinkedIn for the past year. That's why I'm here. <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't call it bothering me. I mean, you asked some very interesting questions, and you provided some great feedback. So, Well, I appreciate uh, that. I, Thank you. Actually, like the first message was just like, hey, love your content. Absorb it as much as I can. This is what's happening with me. Right. And, and that's how the conversation started. So if you were bothering me, I wouldn't have answered to begin with. I figured that. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. So I guess uh, SE rule number one, put it on others to say no. Don't say no to yourself. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. So who are you? What do you do? And what are you doing here? Okay. Well, that's a great question. Uh, my name is Chris Snyder. I am a sales engineer for um, cyber, a cybersecurity company called Quadrant Information Security. And I'll be honest, I never thought I would be in a sales role. In fact, I avoided sales role actively throughout my whole life. I, you know, you always, there's always like a negative connotation with sales, right? Like you know, you, the, the atypical car salesman trying to, trying to get you to buy stuff. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So it's just something I didn't ever saw myself doing and kind of fell into a little bit, but um, I was in the military for about seven years, um, not in, in a technical, really technical capacity. I was in the, you know, an airborne unit as an infantry guy. So like the least technical role you could probably think of, um, you know, and then when I got out, uh, right before I got it out, I was like, you know what? I need to find something for a career that's going to allow me to travel. Cause I like to travel a lot, um, possibly do some remote work and, you know, make some pretty good money. Um, you know, I had a lot of friends in it that have been doing it for a long time, you know, specifically the security side. You know, they're all driving Porsches around and, you know, traveling all the time. I'm like, you know what? I wonder, I wonder if I could do that. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm not driving a Porsche around yet, but uh, I'm working Soon. on it. Um, <laughs> okay. but that's just kind of like the last 10 years of my life is, is the military. Um, I got into IT as a help desk technician, right? You know, to start out somewhere because I grew, grew up building computers and it was always a, like a hobby and a passion just to be using them and interacting with them. Um, got a job doing that. And about six months later, I'm a junior system admin, moved into networking as in the NOC. I did that for about a year. And then I moved to the security side just because it just uh, appealed a lot more to me. So I was a threat analyst for a couple of years. And again, never wanted to be in sales, never really thought about it. I uh, started doing some public speaking events, uh, mainly at colleges. I gave a talk on social engineering and, you know, how to hack a corporation using social media and, you know, all kinds of cool stuff like that. And I was essentially offered an internal role as a sales engineer because we did not have one at the time. You know, we had our CTO giving demos, our president giving demos, and uh, it's probably, it's not really a great look, but it's a small company. So everyone's wearing, you know, 10 different hats. Um, so yeah, I, they offered me the role. I was like, you know what, I actually like talking to people about tech you know, public speaking, I was never a big fan of until I started doing these events and it grew on me. I'm like, you know what? Let me try this out. Maybe I'll like it. And here I am, let's see, about 
10 months later, I'm just loving it. So easily one of my favorite jobs I've ever had. So. All right. Yeah. Okay. I have way too many questions. Uh, first, <laughs> first off, you mentioned you avoided sales. Like, right. Did you have opportunity to go into sales and you said no or like how? Yeah. <clears throat> so prior to the military, I actually had a, I had my own business for a short period uh, doing window tending. So that was, a, I guess that's kind of a sales role. I mean, it is a sales role. Yeah. And honestly, it was just the, a change of mentality, right? If you think about it this way, sales is just a transactional interaction between two people. And you do that day to day without even realizing it, right? To an extent. Um, and when I started looking at it that way, I'm like, you know, I like talking to people. Um, if I, if they have an issue, I like to solve it. And I've always been like a problem solver. So in, in the, in the way that sales engineer, you know, as that role works is where you're basically solving business and technical problems. It just came naturally to me. So, yeah. so you, you said, what was your definition? Sales is a transactional. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Sales is transactional between, you know, two different, two people, right? Typically. Um, right. And you're also solving a problem for the other person if you're selling them something, right? Yeah. You go to buy a car, they need transportation. Um, you know, you're, you, you go to a bookstore, you want a book, they sell you a book because you're trying to learn or, or, or read up on something. Yeah. I, th I think I don't enjoy the transactional aspect of sales. Right. Right. If I were to sell a car, I'd probably hate it. Uh, Same. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think sales and tech, it's not, it's no longer transactional. It's no. more relational, right? You're, you're Partnership. Always, like from an SE perspective, you're solving a business problem with technology. Mm -hmm. From a sales perspective, you're solving it commercially. So mm -hmm. both of you are like, both the sales team is still solving the problem. And that's where I like sales. And I've been moved into sales, as you may, may or may not know. Yep. I've been following along. <laughs> tell that story. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. So, and you, you went to the military and lots of people like to play with computers. Not many actually get the opportunity to get a job as right. a this technician. How, like, what convinced the, the hiring manager to give you a chance, given you had experience in the military in a non-technical role? It was actually one of my favorite interviews ever. Uh, okay. and it's still, he's still one of my, one of my, one of my good buddies. I'll talk to him like once a week. Um, this guy, Jason, he was a, he's a senior system admin for the company. And I remember walking into the conference room for the interview and there's a, a desktop computer in pieces. Just like, I'm like, oh, I see it. And I was messing with him a little bit. I was like, oh, let me get some stuff to put this together. And I just started laughing. He's like, he thought it was funny that I was laughing. I was like, I build gaming computers as a hobby. I can do that or we can skip all that. And you can answer, you know, ask me some technical questions. And it, it was probably about 10, 15 minutes of just, to be honest, BSing. And he's like, all right, let me call the IT director. We'll, we'll, we'll get you on the phone and we'll talk. And they basically offer me the job on the spot because it, it was help desk, right? It's, it's entry level. You just got to help users reset passwords and you know, that all, all that good stuff, build computers. It, it was, okay. it was, it was enter entertaining for sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I found most of my interviews that I do well is when I, when the manager and I start messing around with each other. Right. Like, um, I, I feel like it builds rapport. Oh, we got my dog in the background. There you go. Oh, yeah. Got a little guest, is that a poodle? Star. Is that a poodle? It's a golden doodle, so half. But, okay. So I'm, my office is, I, I turn one of my bedrooms into an office, and then she just stares out the window all day. It's great. That's nice. It's, yeah. Uh, and she's calm. So, hey, good job. For now. For now. Uh, uh, for now. <laughs> that's a squirrel. Oh, yeah. That's what she's looking for right now. I guarantee it. She's hungry. Uh, okay. So, and... I'm looking at your LinkedIn. I mean, you don't have you you don't have any university education, but it looks like, according to your LinkedIn, you're currently at university. Is that accurate? No, I, I took a few semesters off. So okay. when I first got in the military, I had multiple plans. Right. Yeah. One thing, one of the good things about the military is you learn how to plan pretty well. I would say. So I'm like, all right, I need plan A, B, C, D, whatever. Plan A was go to college, get a degree in IT, and then look for jobs in the meantime. And um, ended up working out plan A, right? Got my, I, yep. I, went, I went to school for two semesters, got a job, um, actually did quite a bit of calculation and figured out that I could probably make more money long-term skipping college for what I was trying to do, right? Because not that doesn't apply to everything. 
if I got the experience and certifications as opposed to getting a degree because, and I've come across this quite a bit and I talk to friends in the industry too, is um, especially for a lot of IT roles, they value uh, certifications and experience over degrees. Yeah. Sometimes it depends. Um, but generally speaking, I, I think that's, you know, I did a lot of research into it and got the job and started working. And um, I'm actually going back to school probably not this semester, but the next one, just to finish using my GI Bill and finish my bachelor's. Uh, just okay. like online in my spare time. Yeah. Well, no, yeah. this is amazing that you're saying that because I find universities useful for a couple of different things. Right. One, if you're young, straight out of high school, yep. I think it gives you the time to mature and mm -hmm. learn and show that you can learn. But generally speaking, what I found universities are useful for is getting the job. Yeah. If you're able to get the job without the university going through that, then is it really needed? Uh, that's, I guess, a debate that <clears throat> people can have. Yeah, I think it comes down to the individual if they value that. And honestly, I know for if you're planning on taking more, you're trying to get to like director level, you know, the C level, you, you might meet, need some type of advanced degree. Um, actually, I'm pretty sure it's damn near required unless... I mean, it, it depends, right? Yeah, I mean, I've gone back and forth. I mean, you with can, my you head. can always start your own thing, right, and be, be your own uh, CEO. Right. But I, again, I don't think most of us, most people, don't aspire to become CEOs of another company. Like, if mm -hmm. if they're going to become a CEO, they might do that. But I don't think, like, if you're going up the ranks through a, through work, right? I don't. You're going to prove yourself. No one's going to look at a, a degree. Yeah, I would say internally, you'd be, you'd be okay. But like if another company's looking at you, they're like, oh, okay, it doesn't have a degree, you know, but it may affect well, yeah. them. Uh, well, you have to be a CEO for another company to look at you and say, like, maybe you should get him as a CEO. I yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, most companies hire CEOs who've been CEOs. Like, it's the same thing as sales engineer managers. You either go up the ranks oh, and become an SE within the company, but it's very difficult to move as an individual contributor from one company to another company as an SE manager. At least that's how I see it. And yeah. No. Okay. So glad. I agree. I agree. Um, all right. So you got a job as a, well, what's it called? Help desk technician. Yep. Then you went into networking, which is a little bit different. Did you know, did you, had you studied about networking before getting that job or did you learn on the job? Honestly, it was, uh, let's, I did a boot camp for Net, Network Plus. Um, I did have a pretty good understanding. Now, I will say this about that, about that job. Even as help desk, I was doing some pretty advanced tasks. I was more, of, I was more operating as a system admin. Um, okay. You know, I was depl I de deployed a VoIP system. Uh, I was setting up VLAN. So I, I was learning networking as help desk. Um, yeah. And then I got an internal promotion, basically a lateral promotion into the NOC at the same company. So I already knew the environment. I knew the inf infrastructure. It was just a little bit different um, department, and uh, it worked out well for me. So I, I learned on the job, and I you know I just obviously had a home lab and all that good stuff where I'd play around in. Yeah, all right. And uh, <clears throat> you went into uh, uh, being an analyst. Mm -hmm. How did the conversation go from the analyst role? to entice you for the sales role, considering you've been avoiding sales like, a, like the plague. <laughs> um, so actually, so when I went to go down to that college to give that talk, um, it was, it's a, they just recently started a cybersecurity program and they, and they're, they're actually a client of ours. So they're like, Hey, can you, can you have someone from your SOC come down and, uh, you know, security operations center, come down and give a, a talk on whatever, it doesn't matter. Just get these kids, you know, involved and, and interested. Um, so we get down there, I give the talk. That was the one I was referencing earlier, the, the, um, how I would, how attackers might target a corporation and then using, yep. you know, social engineering and social media to gain access to, to privileged accounts. Why did, why did they pick you to go do the talk? I volunteered. Okay. <laughs> I volunteered. So okay. one, one habit I try to instill in myself is if I'm scared to do something or nervous to do something, I just do it. Just, I just force myself to do it. And I always end up liking it after. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, so I, we get done with the talk. Um, and then, you know, the, the professors and a couple of the, their assistants were like, oh, that was awesome. You know, you should come down and do some more of that. I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. 
on the car ride home because I rode with the um, the CEO at the time. He's like, Chris, have you? He's like, look, I know you've been in the sock for a couple of years. Uh, we'd like to keep you around. Is there, you know, like some type of role that you'd be interested in? Me? He's, he, what about, you know, like a sales engineering role where you, it's not like salesy. You'd be talking to clients, prospects, you know, doing demos and explaining the product because you know it pretty well. And I jumped on, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And then that spawned a um, kind of a training kickoff, right? Where he would do mock demos and, and blast questions at me. And it reminded me a lot like the military promotion boards, which if you're not familiar with, they just, it's like a bunch of higher ranking people just grilling you for however long. And it, it was like that, you know, we do it once a week for about, I think we did it for six months before I was uh, unleashed into the wild as an SE for the company. So that's what that looked like. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So going back to the, like the presentation, how did you prepare for that? Considering that's, it doesn't sound like it's something you've done in the past. I mean, I've done presentations in the, especially in the military, when you're doing mission planning, you're presenting to, um, you know, you're like, Hey, we got a design a mission to do this. And you'd have like a, sometimes you do PowerPoint slides, you know, when you're deployed, you don't have access to PowerPoint. So you, you yeah. write it down and kind of plan it that way. Um, I think doing the military mission planning helps me quite a bit with, you know, I translated that to normal life. Right. Um, yeah. so when I prepare for this is like, first I picked my topic, right? What, what, what's going to engage like a younger audience? Like what, what's important to kids these days, right? Social media, Instagram, TikTok. you know, TikTok, all that stuff. I was like, you know what? Let me do a talk on something a little sexy, right? Like social engineering, very sexy topic, mm -hmm. right? Um, how do I, Okay. It's a cybersecurity program. What are they interested in? How are maybe how are attacks uh, conducted? Right? How do how do you kick off a ransomware attack? So I put all that together. I was like, you know what? Let me do it this this way. I built out like a little skeleton with you know. Here's what I'm gonna talk about. I did a PowerPoint um, presentation. It was not. It was like ten slides, twelve slides maybe. Okay. Um, and actually, I'll send it to you when we're done here, just because it's funny. Uh, it's got some pictures with dogs and stuff. But and that's what I did. I and I and when I do. When I do these discussions, it's a discussion, right? It's not a look at this slide. Okay, next slide. Next, that's boring to me. So when I got to a slide, I would turn to them and be like, "Okay, so this is how this would happen. What do you guys think about this?" Um, mm -hmm. So it's very interactive. Uh, it kept them engaged. Like there's not one yawn that entire time. I looked around the room to make sure no one was yawning. Uh, <laughs> you got to be cognizant of that. And if someone does yawn, you start talking to them directly. I've learned that trick. I don't know if you, <laughs> you know, what I'm talking about. I was like. Yeah. But yeah, so it went really well. Um, <laughs> Ramsey, how's it going? <laughs> yeah, <yeah>. <laughs> so what do you think about this? You know, <laughs> no, yeah, no, um, it's good. It's good. Right, yeah. But yeah, so that it went really well. That's how, that's pretty much how I ran it. The PowerPoint interactive discussion with the, with the kids and yeah, it was a lot okay. of fun. And uh, then you moved into sales engineering after being grilled for six months. By the way, I love the fact that you were grilled. Most people are just <clears throat> thrown in the deep end. It's like, hey, figure it out. Um, yeah. I don't know if you want to, if you don't want to answer this question, we can cut this part out. But most companies or many companies, unless you work for the government, generally speaking, you kind of have to work, do the promotion, like work as if you have the promotion right. before you actually get a raise or, um, or the title or whatever, or sometimes they give you the title and say, Hey, do do, do it well, then we'll give you a raise. Right. How did that conversation go? So we had just gotten acquired by a, a private equity firm. So they were a lot of moving pieces basically. So I essentially did the role for about six months before I got an increase. And that was due to just bad timing because of the acquisition, which is, it's fine. They, they, they did, they took care of me and then they um, retroactively paid me to my official start date. So they went back six months to, or, you know, whatever right, they took so care of me. They care. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. And honestly, that's why, that's why I like this company is that it's a smaller company. The culture is great. There's a lot of veterans. So I, a lot of similar mindsets, like the CEO, for instance, is now president, he, the one grilling me, he was in the Marines. So the, the line of questioning was, uh, was great <laughs> to say the least, uh, which, which, uh, is better army or, or Marines. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get into that. Coming from a, a Canadian person, I really don't, don't see the point. <laughs> but it's just, 
it's it's it's, like, it's uh, sibling it's sibling rivalry right you, you, you get you yeah, talk yeah. trash back i mean we trash talk each other all the time it's great well if like if we put it in canadian speak um i i don't know if you watch hockey but there's two teams yeah. in ontario i grew up playing right. hockey so Okay, so there's the Senators and the Maple Leafs, and they just hate each other for some reason, and they, they're both not great. So it all it starts off with like one chirp, right, and then it becomes this yeah. whole thing, and it's just like a blood feud for the rest of the time, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, and you've been in SC for less than a year, right? Mm-hmm. You're the only SC in the company. Correct. And the the reason we kind of jumped on this call is I shared with you a book that I'm writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, or at least I shared with you the draft. I don't know if you, I don't know how you actually went through it, considering it's, uh, you know, it's it's not edited or anything. But I appreciate it. And it looks good so far, by the way. I just want to, I, I like, okay. I like it. <laughs> Thank you. So, how are you building your own process? Because you, you're, how many? Oh, first off, how many salespeople do you support, and how are you building your process? Uh, currently three. I actually just started recently chasing deals down myself, so I'm acting in a little bit more of a sales capacity. Why? Which is kind of kind of interesting and fun to be to be honest with you. Um, but why 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 did you decide to be proactive in that sense? Honestly, I like the company <laughs> and I like okay. money, so uh, it doesn't hurt to. Um, and and I and I look at it as practice, right? I want to get better at the sales side, like the technical side. I can do on my own, no problem. But when I'm given the opportunity to to you know get a little bit more skilled on the sales side, I'm going to jump on that opportunity. So I was just at a conference in Tampa last week and pretty much by myself at the booth by my, you know, the whole time. And I took that as an opportunity to build some networking. So I was talking to like my booth neighbors and um, look at some possible partnerships because we are trying to build out our channel. So I'm just trying to learn as much as I can about the various moving parts of sales. Um, so that's why I started kind of going after deals on my own uh, to an extent. Right. Yeah, but no, that's good. The reason I was asking is most SEs when like it's a, it's time to pass on the puck to sales, they just they're in such a hurry to just wash the hands of the deal or anything. Just you, t- that's it's your job now. I'm moving on to my next demo or next proof of concept or whatever. So I just thought it was interesting that you're doing that. Uh, <clears throat> I actually so I, ha- I think I have a unique role as a SE at this company because of how small it is and the fact that I'm the only SE. I actually work with customer success quite a bit. So I do post sales. I don't just do, um, I don't do the, the throw over the fence thing where like, Oh, here's, yeah. here's the, we did the demo. They, here's the, you know, the, you know, the proposal. Okay. It's your turn. No, I, I sit on, um, as many touch point meetings with our clients as possible because I'm a technical resource. Right. And if I'm not busy doing something like a project or a sales call <clears throat> or anything, you know, that side of the house, I pop on these calls to keep that that client engagement going, um, which I like a lot, actually. I do like it. Yeah, so I I mean, that's how you build relationships. Exactly. Oh. And, I, and we, we view our clients as partners, not just like, hey, we offer this to you, and then that's how it works. We try to be as interactive. And yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the easiest customers to sell to are the ones that you already have, unless you mess it yeah. up. Because once you mess it up, it's the hardest customer to sell to. It's like they have a bad taste in their mouth. Like, I don't know. I've, I had a car, which uh, shall remain nameless, but it rhymes <laughs> with Ord. <And laughs> it, it just uh, it was it kept breaking down on me. Yeah. Now, I need to buy another car. I like, I like the way the Explorer looks, but there's no way I'm going to buy it just because of the bad <clears> taste. So yeah, um, if, if I had a better experience, maybe I would consider it. Okay. Uh, how you mentioned you're working on, there's a bunch of things you're working on. It sounds like, but yeah, there's the channel. Mm-hmm. You're working on the post sales aspect of it, which is great. Yep. There's the pre-sales aspect of it. Um, what is your process? Like, because you're the, you're the first SE, you can do whatever you want. Almost. Do you have guidelines in place? Like I will not talk to this customer until they're qualified this much or they've asked these questions otherwise you'd be all over the place all the time and you won't have time to actually do any of your work what are the criteria that you've put for yourself and your sales team to jump on calls for example so i'll say this right now our sales team is extremely good at vetting 
and qualifying deals before they even get to the demo phase. I have not really had any issues where I get to, <clears throat> excuse me, get to a demo and I'm like, why, the, why are we even on this call? I have yet to experience that. And that's, I know that's extremely rare. So I'm appreciative of it. Yeah. Um, but I have had some, you know, some input. I'm like, Hey, um, you know, here's some, maybe some questions, some technical questions to ask before we get to the demo. Cause then I could tailor it. Right. I can be like, yep. Hey, I heard that you guys use this. This is what, you know, this is how we can integrate with that or you know, things of that nature where it's, it's not just a canned demo. It's, I t I've taken something they may have told a salesperson and built a little, little bit around that. Then I'll throw that in there. And um, I feel like that's pretty effective. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty good. The question that I ha that popped in my head first was, is the sales team, hopefully if the company is successful, the sales team is going to grow and yeah. you're going to have other SEs. When, when teams grow, uh, the level doesn't stay the same. Uh, right. It does, doesn't mean that you're hiring or they're hiring bad salespeople. It's just it's harder to train and make sure everybody's on the same page. Is that do you think the company is going to grow to the point where you're going to have a problem? And if so, what are you going to do about it? So I'm going to throw out some theoreticals, right? Um, let's say I know we're hiring three salespeople right now or, or trying to or two to three salespeople. So there's going to be a little bit more workload for myself. Um, Couple ways I'm tackling that, and I'm, 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 I like to take the initiative and and solve problems before they arise. And I'm pretty good about finding them. So I went ahead and started building a channel partner sales guide, which gives them an overview of you know how to sell our product, our services, um, questions you might want to ask, and it's just a really good reference guide, right? That kind of tackles some of that initial maybe new salespeople that don't know it very well. That might help them qualify deals a little bit better off the bat. Um, not only that, I'm, I write down everything I do, right? And if we, if we go to hire more SEs down the road, I'm creating a somewhat of a training guide for them. It's very similar to the channel partner sales guide, but it goes in, into the technical side a little bit more because they're going to be the technical uh, right. resource, right? So they need to know a little bit more. Um, so I'm building, those are two things I'm really working on right now on top of some other stuff, but that, as good. far as the, the problem you're talking about, that's kind of what I've started doing for that. Okay. Uh, by the way, that first document, the channel sales guide, is that to should be shared with the channels or with the salespeople selling into the channels? So that would be more like a partner. So a channel partner, okay. that would be their resource reference guide right. to the product. Okay. And, um, okay. Yeah. Um, have you shared that with them? Yeah. Uh, not yet. I'm still, I'm still building it out. We are we're, we're building out our professional services a little bit. So I'm adding as that's, Ooh. um, and we also started managing EDR and some other things. So it's, it's almost a working document probably for the next yeah couple months. And then I'll, well, especially the tech on the technical side, that's going to be a working document. Like it'll be a it's living, gonna, breathing document. It's going to be a living document for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's one of the challenges that founder SEs have is, all right, we, I wrote this guide for I love technology it. <laughs> and we didn't hire anyone for a year and now the yeah. technology's changed and I have to update this thing. So, yeah, all right. What, what have you found to be the, like some of the challenges that you're facing? Honestly, because of, we didn't have, so I did get a little bit of training, right? When I, when I told you to train up to become an SE, but as far as, you know, um, you talk about when a new SE goes to a new company, do they have any type of onboarding and SE training? I didn't get a whole lot of that, but I will say this though, I have access to our CTO, the one who developed the software and all the salespeople, all I have to do is text them or call them. So I do have a really good support system. Yep. The biggest challenges I think right now is being the only one and this is where you came in, right? And a lot of other SCs and, um, you know, books and various things, they fill in a lot of those gaps that exist in this company for me, right? So. Like what? If you don't mind sharing. Um, I'm doing a lot of learn on the job type stuff <laughs> that maybe I could be better about asking questions, honestly, to, of the salespeople. Okay. So 
Um, I would like to be included a little bit more in the the documentation when it comes to the actual contracts. Um, okay. I do see them, but I'm not really like I'll help with some of the scoping, for instance. Right. But um, the SOWs and stuff, I would like to see myself helping out with that a little bit more. I guess okay. you can consider that a little bit of a problem, right? I don't know. Yeah, Maybe it's just well, me wanting to do more. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th that's kind of a, one of my other clients. We, we kind of got into this where he was he was also like the head of SEs, mm -hmm. but he was the only SE there, right? The plan was to hire him as he was a head of SE at a different company. He became a head of SE at a company that doesn't have SEs. And then, build and it then up. he was going to grow the team. But he didn't have time to do anything because the professional services person didn't want to be part of the scoping. And we were talking like, whose job is it to, to do the scoping? Right. Right. And we came to the conclusion was that although the sales engineer has to do some initial scoping, initial discovery, right, it would be on the professional services team to do the actual scoping because they know exactly what's going to need to take place and how long everything takes place. So right. as an SE, if you're doing a statement of work, the, the SOW, you might be completely off because you have, you haven't right. done that, especially if you're far removed. If you're like, you're, it seems like you're a one man bed who does everything. So you know, everything and you don't have a professional services. Well, team, I wouldn't so. go that far, Ramsey. I don't know everything. <laughs> anyway, I'm giving you a compliment. Take it. Jeez. All right. right. Uh, thank you. Thank so you, thank you. you're welcome. So yeah, like it's, depends on where you are the the bigger the company gets that's the thing about processes is that mm -hmm. we build them and they would have to develop and change depending on the size of the company right right like right now you're not in any it doesn't sound like you're in any, in any discovery like are you in discovery calls oh okay, well so every call is a discovery call right but yeah <laughs> thank um, using my words against me all right cool there you go yeah i like to weaponize it you know uh yeah so our salespeople are pretty good about asking some pretty good initial discovery um questions right that's why i told you like i, I like to know a little bit about what environment i'm gonna be presenting to right but yes i am involved in quite a few of those early discussions they'll they'll just like cc me on the invite and if i'm not busy i can pop in on it um, okay. Am I needed for every single one? I don't think so. Um, no. But well, I have been involved yeah. Yeah, in some of them. Yeah, I, I, mean, I wouldn't say are you, like, are you needed? No. Is it an opportunity to develop relationships? So when you tell the customer this is a better solution for you? Yes. Uh, I in, agree. In that sense. Now, if you're one, like, one tied to three salespeople, you could. You might have time. If you're one tied to ten, you're not going to have time. Now you're just no, going to <laughs> Um, here's a list so, of questions <laughs> yeah well Go yeah forward. and then here, here's a pre-recorded demo for anything that's less than uh 50k for example uh yeah I don't know, depends on the company uh, that, that's actually funny you mentioned that because we're doing <laughs> I, I work with the marketing team quite a bit in creating content and um if you go to our website i helped build the interactive demo on the front the page the, the front screen there okay uh, I'm, I'm going to your website right now quadrantsec.com um yep and if you scroll down about let's say halfway down the page it'll have the little you're, you're assuming, you know i know how to write how to spell stuff oh there you go quadrant <laughs> with an a how is quadrant not quadrant i don't know. anyways scroll scroll down halfway through the page yeah it should be like a little let's mini explore. mini console picture yeah dashboard highlights yep oh man look at save that's that's funny I have a problem with these automated demos, to be honest with you. Okay. So we actually, the marketing team and I, we, I, I engage them quite often just because I enjoy helping and, and doing stuff like that. And we we're like, how much, how much do we want to show during the interactive demo? How interactive do we want to go? And we, we've, we narrowed it down to like X amount of click throughs and we've tailored it too. We've, we've edited it a couple times. And when people click through, we found out that like 99% of the time they click through the whole thing because yeah. if it sucked, they wouldn't click through the whole thing. They'd be like, all right, screw this. Yeah. I don't want to click every click. People click, right? Um, right. For, for me, uh, ask an expert book a demo. I, I went through the entire thing. So I, I'm, I'm one of your stats now. Um, yeah. The, the one hey, thing ben, get another one. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that, like, I think it's a very useful tool. Right. It's just 
it needs to be used in a way that you know how we say when we're doing a demo don't click don't click every button right don't talk about features except these things that's what they mostly talk about and there mm -hmm. is no story behind it and i think like the text might need to be edited or to share the story it's like versus here you click on this now you get to the reports and now you click on the dashboard and all that that's why i don't like it right? i i appreciate that yeah um thank you for the input I oh, know it's in general. I'm not talking about yours. It's just that those. Oh, I thought. Like, I, feel like... I mean, I would love some criticism or constructive criticism, right? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. So it's a criticism. I don't know if it's criticism. Like the tool itself, I think it's very useful in marketing, right? And, uh, very useful once you're doing the demo. But initially, like, we're, it's the opposite of what we're taught to do. How to how to do a demo, right? Right. That's why we just and our 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 process our thought process on this is it's just visual something for them to like look at right because yeah. we have gotten quite a few demo requests from people clicking through that because you know it tracks all the yeah, yeah. metrics there. I, I think it would and it's um, surprisingly effective i honestly was was like is this really going to get us you know more calls more meetings and that's that's interesting i'll, I'll yeah. have to uh, well here's a question then um would it be better to have like a loom video of you Explaining, like, doing it. Guess what, Ramsey? Guess what I'm working on? <laughs> so I, I, right, I, want, I want to see the stats. I want to know the difference. Uh, okay, all right. Give me, so obviously the holiday's coming up. It's a bit rough on timing. I just did the conference. Uh, but I'm getting with marketing after the holidays. We're going to, about 10 different videos we're going to put up. Um, various, we're going to go through, like, I know you say not to go, basically cover a short video, you know, a couple minutes for each feature yeah. but tell a story about how this would help solve a problem right and then yeah. the one that i told you about or may i may not have told you about it but um i was like does anyone have a video or any information on what does a sales pipeline look for a client and what that what i mean by that is explain the entire process right so if you became our client this is what it would look like here's how we help you through the initial calls, the scoping, the, you know, um, implementation, how we're going to hold your hand through the whole thing. What happens after all that's done, right? The customer success portion, um, all the meetings that go on that take place after where we're, you know, doing tuning. Cause we're, it's obviously we're an XDR. So we do alert to like alerting. How are we going to tune those? How are we going to monitor your environment and follow up? And it, we've decided that's, you know, it might be a good video. I have not, I have not seen anything like that where a company literally walks through how it might, it's going to look, you know? And I don't know, we thought it might be a good idea because I know like if I was to hire my company, I would be curious as to what it looks like. Like, okay, so we have all your equipment now We're you're monitoring our stuff. Like what, Please explain what yeah. happens next kind of thing. So, so is that like after the contract is signed? Yeah. So, yeah, basically. So very light That's on good. the before contract, but it's mostly to cover the implementation and, and after that, like how the engineer team is going to help you implement the, the products and the services and then the, the support that comes after it and walk through all of that. I, I have yet actually, to see a company that does that. Actually, I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Like one of the biggest struggles that companies or the customers have is they don't know. Right, we signed the contract. Right. Now what? When do I, when do I receive the licenses? When does it expire? Exactly. Who's going to implement it? How are we going to implement it? Uh, who do I call if there's an issue? Yep. None of that is easily available, especially when it comes to like large companies. Maybe yeah. they do it. I haven't seen it. <clears throat> Oh. That's uh, number ten on a list, so be a, okay. you know, well, no, that's a good. Video. But I, honestly, uh, I, like, I, go ahead. I I, I I I was like, you know what? Wonder. I know I've dealt with in the past. Like, there's one vendor I'm not going to name them, but we're trying to do an integration with them for one of our clients, and we can't get a hold of anybody. We emailed, we called, we've did their little online chat box trying to talk to somebody. Nothing. We can't get anything from these people, and. We even had our client reach out to them and they're just not answering anything. Um, and it's a product that's like still actively sold. So it's not like it reached end of life. And I'm like, you know yeah. what? This, that actually kind of got me thinking like, 
they sold a product and now they don't get they don't care they're like yeah whatever yeah hey, they're they're I, and i don't well, want that's... i don't want to see that for us i want we don't do that by the way but i want to i would like to have a video kind of describing you know what that looks like after the sale after you sign yeah. that paper here's the customer success team that's going to come in here's an engineering team that's going to walk you through the install process um that support afterwards like okay something's not logging properly or whatever how's here's how we're going to help you fix that you know just things like that and i think that i have not seen that so yeah it's kind of an idea i had that uh, i, I think that's a great cool. idea so. i think another video could be what's the scoping process like because a lot of customers yeah. say like hey i met you a couple of times now go give me a give me an offer right? <laughs> and yeah. they don't understand like hey, we need to have come kind of a few discussions and the problem with that is it might scare some people off. It's like, hey, I don't want to jump on a hundred calls, right? Um, yeah. So, but yeah, like it's it's an idea to bring. That's why I love talking to people. We can come up with ideas. So yeah, I, that's the same. That's why. I... And uh, w one of the questions that we that I wanted to talk to you about is the channels. Like, you're you're writing this document to help them sell more. Right. What does the process look like? Like, are you? Are you enabling it? Are you giving training to them, or is it do they do on their own? And then call you whenever they have a customer that they want to, they want you to talk to. How does it work? So we're in the process of building our channel out. The next year is going to be pretty heavy with the channel and the resellers and partners. So currently, with our current existing partners, I'll do like the demos for theirs um, for their clients, right? Um, and some light training, right? I might do a like a training demo, which I actually do for our current clients too. When they get new hires, I'll do a training demo. But anyways, um, because that hasn't been matured fully, I guess, uh, the channel partner side of the house, I haven't really had to do that enough yet. So right. now what I envision is I do trainings, right? I yeah. Here's the guide. Okay, guides are cool and all, but what if they want to ask a question? I'd rather jump on a, on a meeting or a call or some sort, run through it with them, maybe do a demo, like a training demo, like, hey, here's all everything works. And, you know, if you need to show someone real quick or point them at the website and show that, you know, sh some features, talk about it. But I still want you to be able to give a really good elevator pitch with some technical, um, you know, acumen. Yeah. So I would, yeah. I would like to do like a call, tr like a training call. So I, I could see that being a thing and I would like to do that. The, the one struggle I've seen people have with uh, channels is the channels don't really care about their product, right? Mm -hmm. They have a million products to sell. So the question always becomes, how do we get the channel to sell our product over somebody else's, right? Um, I mean, it might I depend on the industry. The question. What was that? It might depend on the industry. Like we're, since we're um, a security provider, there might be less products, so to speak, um, as opposed to like, if you sold printer paper, right? You have like a thousand different types of printer paper you sell, um, yeah. where they might have, they might be reselling a couple other companies, but typically we align ourselves with partners that it's synergistic where there's some type of synergy. We're like, Hey, you sell our product and we're going to, it's like one hand washing the other kind of thing. Yeah. Um, cause the one yeah. side, I feel like when it's one side, you're not going to get much business out of them. Right. Well, yeah. Like, well, yeah, so I guess that's the thing. Like, wh how do you enable them? What, how do you entice them to sell your product? Because, like, I know there are there isn't as much competition as like paper factories, but for example, yeah. one var can be selling Palo Alto, Fortinet, Checkpoint, Cisco. Uh, these are four and whatever all Trend Micro or whatever. Uh, how do you get them to? It could be that the customer wants a specific one. So. I think vetting the partnership first too. I know that there might be some um, anti-competition language in the contracts. Like, hey, if you sell us, you can't sell, you know, so and so that does the same thing, right? I think that's the first step. And and when you build all these channel partnerships, is don't don't forge a partnership with a unless you understand that they're selling you know similar products and you're just using them for like marketing, basically, right? Yeah, which is a tactic I I, I assume. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think uh, channels. I've talked to several people about channels. It's just an interesting, like you need to sell someone to sell your product, 
right? Versus right. someone to someone to buy your product. Uh, so it's a different motivation, different uh, way of thinking. Well, maybe getting them excited about the product, right? Because I've I've given some some demos to the to the resellers in the channel, and if they're excited about the product, they're more likely to or the service yeah. or whatever. That's I, I found, part of it, right? Uh, yeah. Well, I found the best way to excite salespeople about a product is to tell them how much they can make. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, actually going to get. I was like, well, typically offer them, you know, X amount, yeah. and that that gets them pretty motivated. I mean, they're you. Well, honestly, I don't think you could be in sales if you're not really physically motivated, right? Or yeah. Just I mean, I can tell you within my company, if if they come up with a new product that they everyone's excited about, but it won't make me any money, like. I mean, I'd sell it if like an opportunity comes up, but that's not the opportunity I'm going after right. personally. Like, yeah. I, I need to go after the, especially like if my quota is, let's say, ten million, and this product is five k. <laughs> I need to. It's sell probably like, pretty low on the uh, the totem pole. Yeah, you know, like... yeah I need to sell like seven thousand of these exciting yeah. products to actually <laughs> make a dent in my quota. Um, I mean, that's so, just yeah, being like, realistic, right? I mean, yeah. All right. Well, that's a. I'd love to see how you I, like if we can catch up. Well, we'll probably talk more, but oh, yeah, podcast catch up in a year and see how it went. I'd love to hear that. Uh, yeah. But it's time to move on to the not so fire round, Chris. These are the same four questions I ask almost every guest, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about them. Which is start with question number one: is what is it that you love about sales engineering and what you're doing today? So remember, when I told you I was like, ah, I don't want to get in sales, but I'm finding that I really enjoy talking to people and just talking about tech and honestly most people in, in, in the tech world are pretty, pretty chill um, for the most part. Right. And the sharing of knowledge, the, the sharing of ideas, learning from people that, you know, I'd never expected to, to learn from. I think that's honestly my favorite part is just that interaction. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I've, I was talking to someone yesterday, uh, they, you, you, if you look at sales, selling into tech, mm -hmm. even though it's more complicated, the products are more complicated, there's more nuance, it's easier than selling into other companies. Like, for example, selling a sales software. Right. Be for the simple reason that when you talk to people in tech, they actually want to talk to you. Like, <clears throat> they won't talk to you unless they want to. If you're calling them up yes, and say, hey, let's chat, and they don't need you, it's like, nah, it's like, go away. But if they say yes, that means there is a need. Whereas if you're selling something into sales, sales will talk to anybody. Yeah. And they're the most confusing customers ever because, oh, this looks cool. We may or may not have budget. We'll, we'll look at that. Or, you know, you just never get a straight answer from It's funny sales. you say that because I, ha I have noticed that. And I, I didn't really, until you just said that, I didn't really frame it, I guess. You know, you'd have a, someone that says, yeah, we just don't have budget for it. And they'll just tell you. And then that's it. There's no, yeah. um, there's not a lot of gray area with the, the tech side. Yeah. Yeah. Like I had someone laugh at me. Like I called the customer. I was like, <laughs> Hey, I work for this company. It's like, <laughs> he got nothing for us. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you for your time. That's so, great. Yeah. Uh, that was like, I, the honesty, though, I was, you gotta appreciate it. Yeah. It's just, uh, well, for someone who's been on in SE for like half a year or a year and getting someone to laugh in your face is, it's, it's a little bit weird. Was like, yeah, 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 I guess you save me some time. Might be a little shocking. So. <laughs> it, it worked out. Uh, all right, question number two: What, like, what would you consider is your superpower? Um, honestly, the taking initiative and and being the the, the ability to adapt to situations, right? And I'll, I'll give you an example. <laughs> I was giving a demo, and it couldn't have been. It's probably the most interrupted demo I've and ever existed. Okay, um, everyone's phone went off. Do you remember when the? I don't know. You, you're in Canada, so you, you alert. In America, we had an alert. A phone alert. Everyone on the meeting. There was like 20 people on this call. Just started going nuts. I'm like, I just started laughing like while I'm giving my presentation. When it was done, I bounced right back into it, not even like skipping a beat. Then my dog started barking. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. Um, but honestly, it was kind of funny. So that happened. That Abby's barking. Got back to the demo. The one of the guys in the call, his cat started walking across his keyboard. I'm like, you know what? Let's just take a pause. Does everyone have a pet? Just like show, you know, show off your pets kind of thing. 
and it was it was hilarious and it kind of, it gave it um i think when you humanize these calls and these and discussions it just i mean at the end of the day you're people like to buy from people right yeah if you're just some sales robot like okay here's our demo here's our product like they're gonna keep yeah. they're gonna be like all right that was that's when they start yawning and they don't they don't really give a crap right i i, I was talking to someone yesterday for like the episode before this so it'll be out before this <clears throat> and he was saying one of the criticism he got from his boss was that his demo was too perfect <laughs> didn't leave room for questions he answered all the questions before they're being asked he handled all the objections before they were handled yeah I get it. everything was smooth and it was just too perfect to the point where it was not good uh and that's funny because the you know everybody talks about how imp imp uh, perfection comes from imperfection right yeah uh and, you know i had a i had a demo where the fire alarm went off halfway through right you just gotta laugh about it and then yeah like, well it's like, hey, do you want to continue <laughs> the demo outside <laughs> i mean that's and, and, and honestly it was actually one of my probably one of my better demos i've i've given i usually I had a couple people call me after like chris that was awesome you didn't miss a beat because at, at the during the time i was like crap i feel like i've been interrupted you know numerous yeah. times <clears throat> and um no, I just, I, I guess I kept going and kept the ball rolling and it was fine. And it was funny. So, yeah. I mean, it reminds me of politicians who say, don't let a disaster go to waste. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Just, I definitely didn't. Just... I had the dog bark. I'm like, Abby, come here. And I like held her up, you know? <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> All right. Uh, question number three of the not so fire on Chris. Is there a book or resource you would recommend for people in the same situation you're in where they're the first SE having to build a team, having to build a process and all that? Uh, well, firstly, I would recommend your podcast. So let's start there. I know it's not a book format. I know you're writing your book, but um, also I, I pulled out a couple books just for that question here. Okay. okay. Um, this one's not really, maybe not as applicable, but it does have a lot of good information on it just for like, it's called Social okay. Engineering, The Science of Human Hacking. Um, okay. It does deal with a little bit of like emotional intelligence and talking to people and it's, I don't want to say it's because there's a negative connotation with social engineering, but there's some good stuff in there about, um, you know, just listening to people. Right. Um, and I think that's important. And it's something I struggle with in the past is giving whoever I'm talking to room, the room to talk. Um, I had a really bad habit growing up of like talking over people and, you know, things like that. So actually being in this role has helped me with my outside of work interactions with people. I'm building way better friendships because of my job, which is great. I feel like that that's kind of um, a good thing. Uh, real, another really good one is the Sales EQ with uh, okay. you know, by Jeb Blount. Blount. But again, it's it's about Sales EQ, emotional intelligence, stuff like that, and just you know learning how to listen and talk to people is extremely important. And then a book I'm reading now is Demonstrating to Win. I haven't uh, gotten through yet, but so far so good. Maybe I've heard about it. I think I might have heard about it on your podcast somewhere, maybe. Um, that's honestly where I got a couple of the And then the, um, Chris White's book, The Six Habits of Effective SEs. That's eh. that's like the go-to. Yeah. yeah <laughs> so both Chris and uh, and Bob has have been on the podcast. Right. Chris has been several times, and he'll probably be again a few more times. Yeah, I, I think I watched, uh, I watched that one. So Yeah. Uh, all right. These are all good books, so I appreciate yeah. you doing your preparation ahead of time. Yeah, I told you I like I like to prepare. I feel like you're cheating. What is it? Which like number? Which number one is it? That's number three should, of the rules yeah. or whatever. It's a uh, <laughs> uh, uh What's what's the fourth question? You tell yeah. me. Oh come on! I thought you were prepared. Is there a habit <laughs> you're working on today to improve? Maybe you got maybe person? you had a new one for me. I like curveball. No. Remember. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm good because I love what's, uh, I feel it's applicable to whatever's on the board behind you. Is there a habit oh, you're yeah. working on today to improve in your personal or professional life? Yeah. So I'm a big whiteboard person. Obviously I got, I have one on my desk, a little tiny one. That's like my day to day. Here's what I got to do today. Um, okay. and I have the big one, which is like maybe some longer term projects and it's a little bit of business and a little bit of personal. Like I, it's got like, you know, work out for this, this amount of time, do yoga, read, because I read every day before bed. Um, nice. you know, just just lay out habits that are uh, productive, right? And then anything 
work related that's project based i put it on there and i think seeing a visualized rep representation of something in like a text format on a whiteboard really helps me like work on it right it's a good reminder so it's like post-it notes and then whiteboards um okay. so, so yeah. what is that one habit is that is that one habit is using the whiteboards or do you have a habit that you're working on today i would say the the habit would be planning um okay. and execution okay all right cool man yeah cool um chris we're at the end of the show was there any questions you were hoping i was going to ask you but i did not no it was pretty good <laughs> I mean, we actually yeah. covered a couple of things i was like i wonder if we're gonna talk about this and we we, we talked about it which is awesome so i was happy about nice. that right. i like that all right um last question of the day chris where can people connect with you and reach out and talk to you uh i'm on linkedin christopher snyder and i, I assume i could drop my my link with you to post oh, um yeah, or on our my company website quadrantsec.com um if you guys are curious about what that looks like or if you're looking for an xdr that's where you can find me uh, yeah those are the two main ones look at you uh, no TikTok yet i do have a twitter but i it has very little content i'm gonna I'm not going to, I'm not going to drop that yet till I get some more followers. <laughs> okay. So, uh, they are hiring. It seems that quadrant, they're looking for a VP of the channel. So there you yes, go. Yes, we are hiring. We're building out, um, our sales team. And then I believe in February, we're going to have some engineering roles and possibly some threat analyst roles open up just cause we are growing. So remote yeah, if you're looking for a job, check us out. Not you Ramsey. Is it remote? Unless Is it you remote want. or. Yeah, uh, I'd say we're mostly remote. Um, the SOC works in the office typically. Um, okay. But as far as every other role is fully remote, awesome. you might have to, like if it's a sales role, obviously there's travel expected. But. Yeah. Well, if it's a sales role, you have to be near, near the clients, right? as close to the yep. clients as possible. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, man. Well, I appreciate your time. I look yeah. forward to our next chat and uh, yeah. I really want to know what's uh, like, I want to update well I'll just set a calendar invite for one year from now or whatever sounds good so I'll, I'll right, Ramsey, thank you for having me on by the way um, it was an honor it's my pleasure it's my pleasure and that brings us to the end of the show I am curious your thoughts about why Chris was successful in this role. By the way, thank you for being here and thank you, Chris, for coming on and having this chat with me. <clears throat> so here are some of the reasons that I see why Chris was successful. One, he was already part of that company and he was sort of doing some work with regards to pre-sales, although his title wasn't pre-sales. That's one. So he already knew the product. He didn't have to come in and learn the product and learn pre-sales. Two, he had a very good mentor and coach who helped him understand what pre-sales has helped him through demos. That doesn't happen often. A lot of times when you're the first SE to a company, you're working with someone who has never been an SE in their life and cannot teach you how to be an SE if their life depended on it. So that's another exception to the rule. Uh, three, what was the third one? Chris has been in with that company for a while. He loves the product. He loves the team. It, it feels more tight knit. Uh, rather than it's just a job. So that drives people to do to work differently. When you work at a company where it's just a job, you won't do the things that you should do if it was your life, right? And maybe it's not like it doesn't have to be your life, but you know, when you have a team, like let's say in soccer, I substitute I I I am a sub for some uh, some teams where if they don't have enough players, they call me up and I show up. I don't have the same camaraderie camaraderie with them. I don't have the same uh, tightness with the team. It it just doesn't feel like I have any reason other than my own will to give a hundred percent. Now some people might not have that, and even right, right now, like my knees are hurting, I might show up and I might not play at a hundred percent or push myself to play at a hundred percent. Whereas with a group of people that I know and I work with and I love, I would be working at 100% no matter what. So 
these are some of my thoughts. What are your thoughts? What did you learn? Why do you think he was successful where many others who are first SEs are not? Let me know your thoughts. And uh, with that, I'm signing off.